Chapter 23. Gone. Coyote is not in the studio when Charlie wakes up the next morning. When she goes outside later, the driveway and the road are empty. Coyote is not waiting for her in his usual place. She swallows past a sudden sharpness in her throat. It's no big deal, she assures herself. He's probably just off in the woods. She whistles once, then again. He doesn't come. Maybe she thinks he's gone up to visit with Jasmine and Bernie. She whistles several more times as she walks up the road. The two German shepherds are in their pen. Bernie barks a greeting. Coyote's nowhere to be seen. Now she's feeling a chill in the center of herself, somewhere under her ribcage. She goes back into the house where her father is fish finishing his breakfast and Sarita is washing out the pan she used to fry bacon. He's probably off chasing something in the woods, her father says when she tells them. He'll be back. Sarita puts the pan into the dish strainer and dries her hands before she says anything. Soon as he's hungry, that dog will be back fussing at you to bring him some liver. Don't worry yourself. Charlie hates the casual tone they take, but she does her best to believe them. She goes to her room, sits on her bed, and closes her eyes to visualize the truth of where he is and what he's doing. In the first moments, it seems to be a good idea. She feels him weaving his way through the woods, heading toward the sound of dogs barking. Charlie has come to know the voices, the distinctive bark of most of the Eagle Lake dogs. This barking sounds like none of them. These dogs must be from one of the developments. As she thinks this, a road appears in her imagination, directly in front of Coyote, cars flying past. She feels him pause for a moment at the edge of the road, listening to the barking from the other side. Then a squirrel scurries down a nearby tree and runs toward the road. Coyote starts after it, and Charlie hurriedly opens her eyes. She doesn't want to see a car coming, hear the squeal of brakes, the thump of a collision. Could this vision be true? Or worse, would the very act of seeing make it true? As the morning drags by, she checks the windows every few minutes to see if he's back. Every so often, Charlie goes outside to whistle for him. She whistles so loud and so often that Sadie finally comes and she gives her a biscuit and apologizes for not playing with her. When she goes inside, Sadie stays, lying on the porch so that every time Charlie comes to see if Coyote's back, her heart jolts when she sees the red gold form against the sliding doors. But finally, she decides to walk Sadie home. Maybe Coyote will find them and join them on the trail. Everything about the walk is, this time is wrong. Spider webs seem purposely placed to miss the spider stick, catching her bare arms with their sticky filaments. The honking of the goose family grates on her ears, and the usu usually cheerful chatter call of a kingfisher sounds suddenly harsh and discordant. Even the smell of the lake seems wrong, fishy and unpleasant. In one place, where the trail drops sharply as it curves around a tree, she grabs a tree for support and puts her hand directly on a thick, hairy, poison ivy vine that runs up the trunk. Stupid! The poison ivy has been growing there on that tree all summer. She knows to use the sapling on the other side of the trail for support instead, but she's been worrying about where Coyote could have gone instead of paying attention. Sadie, on the other hand, seems totally unconcerned. She trots this way and that, rushing ahead after a squirrel, coming back to check that Charlie's still there, going into the water, shaking and rolling in the leaves to dry herself. Unreasonably, Charlie is angry at the dog for being so cheerful when something might have happened to her friend. Angry even that Sadie is the one who's here with her that in when she should be walking with Coyote instead. Mrs. Davis is outside, weeding the small patch of flowers she has planted along the road where the sun reaches. I haven't seen him, she says when Charlie asks, but that dog knows these woods better than any of us. He's off on some errand of his own, and he'll be back when he's ready. Thanks for bringing Sadie around. Charlie decides to walk home the long way on the road. She can tell anyone she sees to keep a lookout for Coyote, to call her if they see him. But nobody else is out. She's across the dam and halfway up the road to her house before she sees Mrs. Jensen walking toward her with Bo, her black, old black dog, moving slowly and steadily along behind, stopping to sniff, stopping to lift his leg unsteadily to pee. "'Where's your buddy?' Mrs. Jensen asked Charlie. "'I haven't seen him since last night. He hasn't come for his walk or his snacks or anything.' Now don't you worry yourself, Mrs. Jensen pats Charlie's arm. Beau moves slowly forward, his tail wagging gently, and puts his white muzzle against Charlie's hand. Eighteen years old, Beau is the oldest dog Charlie has ever heard of. She pats his head. Like trees, she thinks. Beau is a survivor. Beau used to roam, you know, Mrs. Jensen said. Used to scare me silly when he'd just up and disappear. He'd be gone for a couple of days sometimes, and then, about the time I was thinking he'd, we'd lost him for good, he'd come wandering back, grinning and wagging his tail like he'd been on vacation at the shore. Never did know what he was up to. Don't you go fussing yourself about that wild dog of yours, sweetie. He's just off for a jaunt somewhere. It is Mrs. Jensen's comforting words that get Charlie through the rest of the day. He'll be back for dinner, she tells herself. He'll be back.
At Sarita's urging, she goes swimming with the Davises, taking a swim noodle from the dock box so she can just float, letting the water rush over and around her as she listens to Jeremy and Beth Ann dare each other to try greater and greater feats of bravery. Watch me, they call to their mother on the, her inflatable chair as they leap off the raft or put their faces in the water or take hold of Sadie's tail and let her pull them around her through, through, through the water. Mrs. Davis raises her glass of wine and toasts their every trick. Watch me, watch me! The words, the whoops, the giggles, and splashes take Charlie back to summer evenings with her mother and father. She used to show off for them the way the Davis kids are doing now, and then climb, shivering and blue-fingered, onto the raft and wrap herself in a towel to get warm before going in again. Her mother, who swam the length of the lake first thing every morning from May to October, never seemed to get cold. She could stay in that water until the fireflies were out. Charlie closes her eyes and feels the lap of the water cool against her chin. Memories fill her mind. Full moon nights when the sun would go down behind the hills at the shallow end of the lake just a little while before the golden globe of the moon rose over the hills down toward the dam. The three of them would sit on the raft, the canoe tied the way it is this moment, watching the moon spill a pathway of silver onto the water. She can hear her parents' voice, voices, the sound of her father laughing. The plane crash, Charlie thinks, didn't just take her mother from her. It took her father, the man that laughing on the swim dock in the moonlight, too. A dog begins to bark, and Charlie opens her eyes with a start. It is not Coyote's bark. Mrs. Sutcliffe, wearing sunglasses and a baseball cap, an orange swim noodle sticking into the air on either side, is swimming down the lake toward them. Her chocolate lab boon is swimming in front of her, barking at Sadie, who is splashing toward him now, her tail flinging water as she goes. Charlie glances at the empty place on shore where Coyote ought to be. The chill settles into the space beneath her ribs again. Coyote does not show up for his meal. Her father and Sarita try to reassure her at dinner. Just think how long he went without eating before, her father says. His words don't help. Nearly starving should have been made Coyote more focused than other dogs on where and when he'd sped. A couple of days, Charlie reminds herself as she turns on the porch and ramp lights when it gets dark. Mrs. Jensen said Bo would be gone a couple of days sometimes. But when she goes out at bedtime with liver in her hand... It is as if the darkness, loud with the sounds of cicadas and crickets and frogs and the occasional muttering of the geese from the water, has been emptied of all life. Chapter 24. Four Days. Charlie is running along a twilight road between towering trees, chasing a figure she can barely make out ahead of her. The faster she runs, the smaller it gets, moving beyond her, dwindling into the distance. The world darkens around her. She slows then, her footsteps pounding in her ears like a drum-changing rhythm. It is no use. She cannot catch up. The figure has disappeared now. She stops, doubles over, and tries to get her breath. When she straightens up again, she sees that she is at the edge of a lake, a silvery path stretching across it under the moon. She remembers this path. It'll take her home. She steps out into the water, moving one foot, then the other, walking on the glittering light. She is straining her eyes into the distance, trying to see the other shore, the lights of her home, when the black spot appears against the sheen of moonlight. Her bones turn to ice. Already the spot is growing, swallowing light, closing in. It is the fourth day, and Charlie is walking the sewer line trail. Every day since Coyote disappeared, she has wakened after a fitful night punctuated with a new version of her old nightmare to begin another day of emptiness, another day of walking and whistling and waiting. On the second day, she puts a notice in the messages box, asking anyone who sees Coyote to call her. No one has. She and Sarita have driven up and down the county road and through all the housing developments out beyond Eagle Lake, moving up one curving street and down another, asking everyone they encounter if they have seen a golden dog with a green collar. No one has seen him. Every morning she has written the day's number on her calendar, 64, 65, 66, she refuses to let herself think that the taming could be over. But today, when she put the red 67 in the square for Friday, August 15th, she felt the way she felt all those years ago when her father insisted that there were no elves or fairies in the woods, when she wants to believe more than anything in the world is slipping away even as she holds on with every scrap of determination she can muster. It is a gray day, dark clouds threatening rain, the air hot and heavy and still. She has walked from her house to Crazy Sherman's and back and has started up toward Dixie Trace. Her waist pack is full of liver and biscuits just in case. She will walk every trail she knows before she goes back to eat whatever Sarita makes for lunch. She will go to every place she and Coyote have ever been together, every place he has ever returned to her after a ramble to get his treats. She will whistle and call for him. She will be careful not to let her imagination loose. 
On the second day, she tries a different sort of imagining, keeping careful control of the images, picturing only what she wanted to be true. Coyote in the Eagle Lake woods, heading home. A, bo a bone he had stolen from a yard in one of the developments between his teeth. But she couldn't hold the image against the thought of roads, of cars and trucks, and a new one, a pack of dogs defending their territory, surrounding him, barking, snarling, and growling. Whatever guided her visions before, when she relaxed and let her mind play, now it was fear that took over, making the images the sensations. She dares not trust herself to try again. Since then, she has done her best to keep her mind focused as completely as possible on the certainty that wherever he is, Coyote is a survivor, like Bo, like Tree. Now, as she moves along the trail, Charlie realizes that in the week she and Coyote have walked here, the natural world has changed without her thinking about it, almost without her noticing. Gingerly, she takes hold of a blackberry cane, its thorns prickling her fingers to make, to move it out of the, her way. It snaps back, catches on her jeans, piercing through to her legs. The brambles are still growing, narrowing the trail, but the berries are long gone. Goldenrod and Queen Anne's lace and thistles are blooming now, head high in some places. Even on a day like this one, threatening rain, the world seems drier. The green's less green, and here and there a red leaf signals the autumn is on its way. Nothing stays the same, Charlie thinks. Everything goes away. Looking at the goldenrod, growing so thickly, so bright and tall, she finds she cannot remember what this trail looked like before it bloomed. Is this why her mother chose photography? Was she trying to catch it all before it went away? Her mother is not here to answer, will never answer. Charlie stops as if she has run into a wall. What if Coyote doesn't come back? What if the image of the road, the cars, was real, and there is nothing left of him now but a body among the weeds, a reason for the vultures that circle overhead to tilt their wings and drop down to that pavement? She never thought in all these 67 days to take a picture of him. How could she, Charlie Morgan, daughter of Colleen Morgan, nature photographer, not once think to go to her mother's studio, dig through the boxes, find a camera, and take a picture. If he is gone, there will be nothing to show that Coyote ever lived. Nothing. Nothing at all. To show for day after day for the effort to tame him, day after day of their growing connection. Ahead, Charlie sees the wild rose bush that marks the way into the pine grove. She pushes past it, makes her way through the young pines, and scrambles up the hill. The pine grove has changed only a little since the day she found it, she sees. The moss seems taller, the lichens thicker. The dead branch, with a pair of gray pine cones still attached, lies across the place where the fairy rings grow. But she is not comforted. However small, it is change. Charlie sinks to the ground, stretches her legs out in front of her, leans against a tree. She tries to settle herself, to breathe slowly, to focus her attention on a bit of moss, an ant, and the throm of cicadas. But she cannot seem to get her breath. Something that feels like a great balloon in the center of her, of her is growing, pushing against her ribs, against her throat. If it gets any bigger, she thinks, she will explode, shattering into so many pieces she will never be able to put herself together again. She tries to swallow around a pain, like a blackberry thorns, and a sound begins. She hears it before she understands that it is coming from inside herself, a low moan. It grows louder, rises higher, until it becomes a kind of scream, and she's crying, tears flooding her eyes, pouring down her cheeks. She cannot make them stop. There is no way to wake up from this pain, no way to get away. The black spot from her nightmares has swallowed her. Sobbing, Charlie throws herself down on the moss. Memories come flooding in. The day her father turned from the telephone, his face gone gray and old to say the words that made no sense. Your mother's plane went down, Charlie. Your mother's gone. Neighbors with casseroles, people crowding the house, the funeral at the church that she and her father had never gone back to again. Taking down her mother's photographs, trying not to see them as she did it. Mrs. Jensen coming to at her, touching, patting, hugging, the very things Charlie did not want, could not stand. Amy, acting so weird, afraid to mention her own mother until the day Charlie yelled at her to stop worrying about her, the day she told everybody at school that she was all right, that it was all over, she didn't hurt anymore, wouldn't cry anymore. Other memories came then, a flood that won't stop, the hospital, Amy and Travis, scraped and bruised but on their feet, treated and released, walking so easily into the room, one foot then the other, Travis apologizing, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, the room full of balloons that she had to lie there and watch shrink and droop, flowers she had to watch die, cards from the kids at school, get well, as if she had the flu, as if when she gets out of the hospital she can come back to school and everything will be okay, wheelchair, crutches, Tony, pain. 
Amy's mother on the phone talking about tennis, Becky Sue Lindner and Lake George, Amy gone for the summer with never a word, and Coyote. A good thing she was doing, Dr. Fraser said. She understands now that it hasn't been only her saving Coyote. It has been since that very first day, Coyote saving her. Coyote gone now like everything else. Charlie doesn't know how long the sobbing lasts, but when it dwindles, stops, she lies still for a long time, unable to move. She is exhausted, limp, as if the life has been wrung out of her and there is nothing left. Never in her life has she felt so completely alone. When at last she pushes herself up to a sitting position, her nose is running there and there are pine needles stuck to her cheeks. She wipes her face with the bottom of her t-shirt, pulls her legs up and wraps her arms around them, resting her chin on her knees. Little by little she becomes aware of the sounds around her. Thunder growls in the distance, and she sees that it is darker now than it was. It'll rain soon, she thinks. She should go home, but she doesn't move. She's breathing and counting now, long, slow breaths that don't fill the emptiness inside. She closes her eyes, listens, and becomes aware of her heart, quiet and steady, a slow beat that blends into the zithering of cicadas and crickets, the shriek of a hawk high above the pines. She is not alone. Time seems to stop or stretch. She feels as if she has slipped out of the world of humans into a realm entirely separate of other beings, trees and birds, mushrooms and insects and stones. Something moves nearby and Charlie opens her eyes. Into the dim corridor between the tree to her left steps a fox. She holds her breath. It has not seen her. It stands for a moment, utterly still, and then sits, black ears up, cinnamon coat fairly glowing in the shadows, and wraps its bush of a tail around the delicate white feet. She thinks it may be the most beautiful thing she has ever seen, bright and astonishingly clean, as if it is a plush toy, newly made. Its tail is stunning, each hair shading from cinnamon to gold to brown to black. There is a rustle in the pine needles behind Charlie, and she thinks she turns her head toward the sound. When she turns back, the fox is gone, like a ghost, she thinks, like coyote, coyote. Come back, come home, she sends these thoughts into the air around her, beaming the message out to wherever Coyote might be. Come home! And then, quite clearly, she knows that he is not a body among the weeds somewhere. There is no imagining. She is sure of it. She feels the steady pulse of his heart as surely as she feels her own.